Hello chemistry students. In this video I'm going to do notes to start off solutions. So let's uh, start off with the uh, rhyme of the ancient mariner here. So water, water everywhere. The very boards did shrink. Water, water everywhere. Nor any drop to drink. So you know, hey, why's, why can't you drink the water? Well there's salt in it. So uh, Ocean water is a solution. It's got lots of stuff dissolved in it, particularly sodium chloride. And so we're going to go through and learn how uh, solutions work. All right, so we'll start off here just with a little review. So heterogeneous matter uh, is known as a mixture. And uh, we'll briefly go through the uh, different things uh, to get the solutions. So the mixture is a combination of different substances that retain their properties and you can separate them by some kind of physical process. Um, the particular one we're going to focus on are homogeneous mixtures, also known as solutions. Okay, so suspensions uh, have big particles, you can filter them out. Um, colloids have medium sized particles uh, and they look kind of uh, milky or foggy, those kinds of things. Um, and then we get to solutions and they are well mixed. Uh, and here's a few examples um, of those. We're going to focus in chemistry mostly on liquid based solutions of chemicals and most of them you can't drink. Um, right, so here we go. Um, so a solution is a homogeneous mixture where all the particles exist as individual molecules or ions. And that means that the solute and solvent particles, those are the two parts of a solution, are so small that the mixture is never going to settle out. In fact, they're uh, very difficult to filter. I won't say impossible, but they're very difficult to filter. Um, and they don't scatter a light, so they don't display the Tyndall effect, and that's where um, a colloid or a suspension, if you shine a light through it, you'll be able to see that the, uh, you know, like the fog here scatters the light or like this milky water uh, scatters the light here. Okay, so the uh, solvent is the part of the solution that does the dissolving. It's usually present in a greater amount. It's usually a liquid. Um, and if it's not, you know, it could be a gas um, if you're dissolving another gas. Um, and in chemistry it's usually water. Sometimes we use alcohol, use the term aqueous to describe uh, solutions that are water-based. Alright, so a solute is the substance that is dissolved. It's usually present in a lesser amount than the solvent and it is frequently a solid, particularly in, in uh, chemistry. Okay, so whether or not a solution will form depends on the solute and the solvent. Uh, sometimes in the interactions between those, think back to intermolecular forces uh, that we talked about uh, in an earlier unit. So uh, sometimes water is called the universal solvent because a lot of things dissolve in it, but remember your solubility rules, not everything dissolves in water. Okay, here's a couple of terms to describe uh, dissolving. So liquids that are miscible with each other, miscible, uh, means they dissolve freely in one another in any proportion. So that would, an example of that, you know, alcohol and water, um, rubbing alcohol and uh, ethanol both are completely miscible with water. They'll dissolve in any proportion uh, because they have strong intermolecular attractions for each other. They can, you know, hydrogen bond with each other. However, uh, immiscible liquids, uh, they don't dissolve um, in each other at all. So that would be like oil and water. They just they just don't mix together. They don't mix together um, to a significant extent. All right. So concentration describes how much solute is dissolved. The term dilute means that only a little bit of solute is dissolved in the or in the uh, solution. Well, the term concentrated means that a lot of the solute is dissolved in the solution. 
and sometimes you may uh, go and buy things and they say they're concentrated well that means they have a lot of whatever the stuff is and it's not watered down so you would take the concentrate and add water to dilute it to the you know, useful amount that you need or the useful concentration that you need okay so not quantitative just uh, terms you should be familiar with all right, so the like dissolves like rule uh, says that polar solvents dissolve polar uh, compounds. So a polar solvent is going to be able to dissolve ionic compounds because they're very polar. Um, not necessarily all of them. Remember your solubility rules. Um, and a polar solvent can also dissolve other polar solutes. So for example, maybe acids or um, polar covalent molecules like sugar uh, would dissolve well or alcohols would dissolve well in water. Okay, polar solvent is not going to dissolve nonpolar substances very well. Um, so oil, for example, um, wax, those are some things that would not dissolve well. I see that frequently that uh, students will spill those things and try and wash them with water and it's like, wait, this doesn't work. Okay, let's talk about the solution process to form a solution. So this can be thought of in terms of three steps. So if you imagine the molecules, the, um, the solvent has to be the particles in the solvent have to separate from each other you have to put in energy to make that take place um, so that's why this arrow points up and then you also have to separate uh, the solute particles so that they can go out and intermingle with the uh, separated solvent particles and then you have these particles all you can imagine anyways because um, this is just our uh, a tool that we use to imagine uh, how the solution process takes place. Then the solute and solvent particles are attracted to each other and they come together and combine and that process releases um, energy. A lot of solutions that form uh, release more energy than it took to separate uh, the, the solvent and the solute particles. So many solutions overall um, have a negative change in energy. So they start at a higher value than, than they end. And that means that they give off heat as they dissolve. And uh, that's notable with quite a few chemicals. Uh, sodium hydroxide is an example that comes to mind when you dissolve sodium hydroxide in water. You will, it will get noticeably warmer as this uh, solution process is taking place. All right, so this summarizes the solution process that we just talked about. So solvent particles separate to make room for the solute particles. It's endothermic because uh, it requires energy to separate those particles. Same thing for the solute particles separating. And then when the particles attract each other, it's an exothermic process because energy is released as the particles move closer to each other. All right, let's talk about um, Let's talk about saturated versus unsaturated versus uh, supersaturated. So <clears throat> a saturated solution is going to um, have a little bit of solid left in the bottom of the container. And that's because you've dissolved as much of the solute as you can. And there's going to be just a little chunk of it left over. Uh, like you see here, this is supposed to be sodium chloride. And you can see there's sodium chloride all you know dissolved out here around in the solution. But then there's a solid lump of it left over here. And that is, uh, that means that you know, if you watch this, if you go do this simulation, which you should later, um, that some of these particles are dissolving this solution, then some other particles in the solution are uh, crystallizing back onto the solid here, and that's happening at the same rate. So you have a, a, a situation of equilibrium where um, some is dissolving, some is crystallizing, it's happening at the same rate, so overall you wouldn't notice any change in the concentration of the solution. An unsaturated solution, on the other hand, um, 
it could hold more solute. So the water, uh, there's plenty of room for more solute to dissolve in it. And notice that there's no chunk of solid material left here. So you drop your solid in, stir it up, and it all dissolves. Um, there's not a chunk of, or a lump of solid left at the bottom. Now, super saturated, uh, there are a number of ways that you can make uh, super saturated solutions, but the, the most common is probably just to heat it up um, to a higher temperature, dissolve a bunch of solute in it because solubility increases at higher temperatures, and then cool it down. And that's how, uh, that's how rock candy is made. So uh, if you ever made rock candy, you, you heat the water up, you dump a bunch of sugar in it, and then you allow it to cool slowly over days or sometimes even weeks and uh, the, the sugar in it will crystallize out uh, as the solution cools and sometimes you have to wait for the water to evaporate as well. So just to recap here, saturated solutions you can't get any more solute to dissolve in them. Unsaturated solutions would allow more solute to dissolve and then super saturated solutions, there's been some kind of uh, heating process that's taken place to heat it up and then you allow it to cool and the solute that's in it will eventually uh, crystallize out, but it doesn't do that immediately. Right, let's see if I can get this video to play to show the equilibrium that's present in a... Um, there we go. So you can see... Uh, this is a saturated solution, so you can see that there's uh, particles uh, crystallizing at the same time as there are particles dissolving, and uh, there is a lump of solid. The solution around the solid would be considered to be the saturated solution. All right, so saturated solution is in a state of dynamic equilibrium. This means that the solid dissolves at the same rate as uh, solid forms from the solution. The overall concentration of the solute in the solution and the amount of solid solute remain constant as a result. Alright, so we also need to talk about electrolytic solutions. So electrolytic solutions, root word here, like electrolyte, like think Gatorade, it's got stuff in it that uh, allows your uh, muscles to continue working because your nerves need those electrolytes to be able to transmit electrical impulses to each other. So when your electrolytes, your potassium and sodium, when they get low, you start to have cramps and uh, other issues because your uh, nerves aren't able to transmit messages effectively uh, to your muscles. So <clears throat> Uh, electrolytes are, when you dissolve them in solution, they're going to be able to conduct electric current. Ionic compounds and acids tend to be the best electrolytes. So all of your ionic compounds, including your bases like sodium hydroxide and potassium hydroxide uh, and all the soluble metal hydroxides, those are all going to be electrolytes as well as all of your strong acids. Okay, your uh, non-electrolytes are substances that don't produce ions when they dissolve in a solution. So uh, think of your uh, covalent compounds, and the only exception of the, that is uh, acids are electrolytes, but all other covalent compounds, uh, for the most part, don't form ions, so they are non-electrolytes. And here's what you would expect to see. Um, if you had a non-electrolyte in this kind of setup, uh, the solution is here to conduct electricity between these two prongs. Uh, non-electrolytes like just pure water or say sugar, if you put it in there, wouldn't conduct electricity. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, if you put a, a weak electrolyte in there, maybe a weak acid or a compound that uh, just weakly forms ions, it would conduct a little bit of electricity. And then if you put something in there, like a strong acid or a soluble ionic compound, it would strongly conduct electricity. And you'd be able to see that the light bulb lights up completely. Thanks for watching.